I'm going here with us, but another pastor as well, I believe. Pastor Gloria, are you in the room? Oh, she, there she is. Everyone say hello. She's uh, uh, someone who's passionate for children's ministry, and she has come to interview for the All-Stars Open position. So let's give her some love and help her to know that she would be so supported if she were to accept the call to serve at Adam Down Church. Uh, friends, being a parent, being a parent is difficult. Let me tell you how difficult it is. One mom shared a story which I think captures it well. She said, I know a lot of people suffer during COVID and I don't want to be insensitive, but for me, COVID was really restful, she said. Getting COVID forced her to spend a few days by herself. The fever, body aches, coughs, all of the other symptoms of COVID were hard, but not as hard as her normal life of being a working mom of multiple kids. As she told me about her COVID days, her eyes sparkled as if she were talking about a wonderful vacation. When I had COVID, I could wake up whenever I wanted, and I was supposed to sleep all day. I would go to the bathroom, and no one would interrupt me. I never had to say, I'll be there in a minute. And I think this small story shows us that life is hard because people keep raising expectations all around us. Everything costs more, so we have to work more. Being there to celebrate with our friends is harder as our friends become more scattered. Schools expect more from students, but also more from parents. We are expected to help with homework, attend events, support fundraisers, because there's so many roles that we play and burdens you carry. I hesitated before preaching today's message this message that you are supposed to disciple your kids. Our passage for today declares that parents and other family members bear the primary responsibility for the discipleship of the children. Pastor Gloria, I'm not preaching this just because you're here. Yes, pastors and Sunday school teachers help by clarifying what the Bible means, but the ones who are to love on the kids and teach them by modeling what it means to obey the Lord are the adult family members. Parents often ask the church to do a little bit more. I'm busy with so many things. Can I at least outsource religious instruction to you? Aren't you the expert? Aren't you the one who's paid to teach my kids about God in age-appropriate ways? Can't you do for my kids what my pastor did for me when I was a kid? And these are fair questions. Let me explain why I think God is doing less through the church than before. After the Korean War, there were many war orphans who were raised by churches. In the absence of parents and other family members, the church had to do more, including the discipleship of those kids. Similarly, when Koreans first began to settle in America, parents and kids had a huge culture and language gap. And so the church had to do more in those exceptional days. But now, even though I don't understand everything my daughter is saying, um, I don't know all of the slang, we speak the same language overall, and our culture overlaps enough. So God says, you must talk to your kids about faith and model a life of trusting and obeying God for them. Since you can, you must. Because without parents doing their part, church becomes a mediocre Disneyland especially during VBS. There is this suspension of disbelief as kids choose to get hyped, entering church as we pump up the music, create a fun and friendly environment where Bible stories come to life. Smiles and rewards are constant. But when they leave church, most of the kids are thinking, ah, now back to the real world. And in the real world, parents must model the faith that is talked about at church. Because without seeing faith lived out in the home, most kids will not be able to access the spiritual gifts that will equip them to do the good works that God has planned in advance for them to do. Without real-life mentors outside of church, faith will not move from feelings into life choices. Without seeing faith lived out in the real world, kids will not experience resurrection power. So after providing financially, 
and supporting them emotionally, helping them stretch intellectually, guiding your kids socially, you're still not done yet. You must mentor them spiritually, modeling how to trust and obey God. I know it sounds like a lot, but today's passage doesn't just give burdensome commands, it also comes with powerful promises. So would you pray with me before we enter the text together? Dear God, we thank you for the next generation, the babies and toddlers, the children and teens, and the young men and women who have recently left home. We know that each of their lives is precious in your sight. You have great plans for them all. As we take seriously what you're commanding us to do for them, would you help us to believe fully what you're promising to do in us? Now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our heart be made holy and pleasing to you, for we pray these things in Jesus' name. God's word for us today comes from Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 1 through 9. These are the commands, decrees, and regulations that the Lord your God commanded me to teach you. You must obey them in the land that you're about to enter and occupy. And you and your children and grandchildren must fear the Lord your God, as long as you live. If you obey all his decrees and commands, you will live a long life. You will enjoy a long life. Listen closely, Israel, and be careful to obey. Then all will go well with you, and you will have many children in the land flowing with milk and honey, just as the Lord, the God of your ancestors, promised you. Listen, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone, and you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your strength. And you must commit yourself wholeheartedly to these commands that I am giving you today. Repeat them again and again to your children. Talk about them when you're at home and when you're on the road, when you're going to bed and when you're getting up. Tie them to your hands and wear them on your forehead as reminders. Write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. This is the word of the Lord. This is for dads and moms, uncles and aunts, grandparents, godparents, and friends that are like family. This is for everybody. When the passage is talking about your kids, it's using the second person plural. And all of you all, have kids, ex except for the kids that are here. Every network of Christian adults must, in their day-to-day -day life, show kids how to follow Jesus. And before you can teach someone else how to follow God's laws, you must follow God's laws. In chapter 5, the previous chapter, Moses preaches on the Ten Commandments. And he begins chapter 6 by saying, in verse 1, these are the commandments, the decrees and regulations that the Lord your God commanded me to teach you. You must obey them in the land you're about to enter and occupy. All of you know about the Ten Commandments. You know that they exist, right? You know that the Ten Commandments are good for society. But it's not enough to know about them or approve of them. You must know and understand the Ten Commandments and live by them. That was God's requirement for entry into the promised land. It's the same now for members of the church. To be a part of God's kingdom, you must live by the laws of God. I'll quickly list the last six commandments that deal with our relationships with each other. You must honor your parents. You must not murder, steal, commit adultery, lie, or covet what belongs to others. And the first four commandments deal with our relationship with God. We must worship only God. We must not reduce God to some caricature. We must not use God's name to manipulate others. And we must make time on every seventh day to rest and to worship. At another time, I can elaborate on these Ten Commandments. I think each of them deserves their own sermon. But for today, all I want to say to you is you have to live by them. It's not enough that you know that you can't make right turns in New York City. The police officer will not give you credit for knowing the law if you didn't bother to follow it. In the same way, God is not impressed that you know that the Ten Commandments exist. 
or that you know, maybe you're one of the few people that can list all 10 of them. That's not enough. God wants to see you live by them. Amen? Amen. Verse 2 gives us two reasons why we actually follow the law. And you and your children and grandchildren must fear the Lord your God as long as you live. If you obey all his decrees and commands, you will live a long life. Fearing the Lord your God, it means trusting that God has the authority to command you. If you fear traffic police the way I do, you follow the traffic laws when you believe they are present. So if you fear God, you follow God's laws because he's everywhere present. It's that simple. Now, your first motivation for following God's law is that, that it's how you teach your children and grandchildren to also fear God. This is honestly the number one reason I put on my seatbelt. I sometimes wonder, do I need to bother putting on the seatbelt? I'm just driving on local roads. But now I see that my behavior determines what my daughter thinks of as normal. Every time I ignore a law, it makes it harder for my daughter to have a healthy respect and fear of the law. And if we lie whenever it's convenient, if we choose lust over faithfulness in marriage, if we become workaholics that are always trying to get more for ourselves, what will our children think of as normal? If we don't praise God because we're tired, if we don't read the Bible because it appears boring, then what will our children believe is normal? Our choices become their default setting. If we do not obey God, we become a stumbling block and make it harder for our children to obey God. I was praying for a person who didn't want to read the Bible. This was a person that knew he should read the Bible, but he didn't have any desire. And as I prayed, I sensed that he didn't realize that there's a connection from reading God's word and knowing what to say to his daughter to encourage and edify her. He could see that his daughter was suffering from anxiety and stress. He had no idea what would be encouraging to say. And he didn't realize that there's a connection between knowing what the Holy Spirit wants you to say to your daughter and hearing God's heart revealed to you in God's word. As I was praying for him, I was praying that his love for his daughter would cause him to dive into the word and that while he was reading the Bible, mainly with a humble desire to help his daughter, that the Holy Spirit would also tell him all the things he needed to hear for himself. Isn't that the way it is for all of us? Even when we don't care about our spiritual growth, God gives us a desire to see our kids and other loved ones become healthy and holy. And as we seek to help others, God uses that to help us for our own growth. Those who go to an Alcoholics Anonymous meeting to support others who are in more raw parts of the recovery they find that going helps them be protected from temptation. And those who lead Bible study to teach others find themselves receiving fresh insight that they otherwise would not have gained. Our love for our children helps us to find the motivation to do what we should do for ourselves. And now the second motivation for obeying God is that through helping kids obey, we are helping our whole community experience God's blessing. Verse 2 ends with a promise. If you obey all his decrees and commands, you will enjoy a long life. It's not just have a long life. You will enjoy a long life. There's plenty of people living who are not enjoying it. Remember again that this is written in the plural. God is saying you all can enjoy life. God is not trying to get us to compete against each other. God wants us to cooperate so that we can all obey and receive God's blessing. He's saying if you as a group choose to worship the one true God and live according to his guidance, then you will be healthy and holy and your life will be peaceful and productive. And this promise is described more fully in verse 3. Listen closely, Israel, and be careful to obey 
then all will go well with you, and you will have many children in the land flowing with milk and honey, just as the Lord your God, the God of your ancestors, promised you. All will go well with you. You will want to have and be able to take care of many children when we walk in God's blessing. This is important for us to consider because in South Korea, there is delicious food, there's catchy music, it's one of the richest countries in the world. But it also has, one of, it also has the highest suicide rate. Hypercompetition in schools fill kids with stress. Parents spend all of their money trying to give their kids an edge. And people fight for jobs that are promising prestige but leave them exhausted. And even those who find life bearable, they do not have enough hope to bring new life into the world. So South Korea has the world's lowest birth rate. I find myself sometimes thinking in a similar way, oh, more kids? I don't think about that anymore. But there was a time when it was a struggle because of the world that I lived in to want to have and to believe myself capable of caring for more children. The promise of modern South Korea was that if you were willing to work exceptionally hard, then you would get exceptional rewards. And all those who believe this false gospel, they created a cutthroat society that left everyone drained and empty. And the South Korean church has sometimes promoted this hyper-individualistic gospel, causing churchgoers to think, if I prove that I'm better than all those other Sunday churchgoers by completing the programs and getting titles at church, then God will bless me the most. But God is telling us to build each other up and to make each other better. Instead of competing to get blessed, we are supposed to cooperate that we may all be blessed. Instead of fighting to be first as if God's blessing is only for the first, we're taught to put Jesus first, others second, and trust that God's abundant blessing will cover us all. That is when we will have the desire and capacity to see more kids around, wanting to raise them well. Being in a land that flows with milk and honey, it doesn't mean being spoiled with abundance. It means having a sense of comfort in God so that you are eager for more of God's work to be done. If we all mentor our kids to obey God, cooperating to help each other follow God's guidelines, then we will flourish as a community. That's the command and the promise. And now we get to the most famous verse in the Old Testament for Jews, verse 4 and verse 5. Listen, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone, and you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. We must love this God who has rescued us. Jesus says that this is the greatest commandment. The extent to which we're supposed to love is with all of our heart, all of our soul and strength, withholding nothing. And the expression of our love for God should be obedience. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. And Moses is saying something very similar in verse 6. Since you love God, you must commit yourselves wholeheartedly to these commands that I'm giving you today. Thus, the most important reason that we obey God is to show God our love. The fact that God promises blessings is a side benefit. The main motivation for obeying God is to express our love to God. And when you love something, you end up talking about it again and again. When Michigan won the college football championship, all my friends in Michigan were talking about getting a picture with a trophy, buying tickets for next year's games, celebrating the high school prospects that had committed to Michigan. And this is because when we love, we get excited and we talk about that topic again and again. Verse 7 tells us, repeat them again and again to your children. Talk about them when you're at home and when you're on the road, when you're going to bed and when you're getting up. 
because obedience is an expression of love and we are to love to the extent of withholding nothing, we should be talking about obedience with excitement again and again. Families that are serious about sports, families that are raising athletes, they talk about training and strategy and motivation and equipment again and again. It's something they love to do as a family and thus sports becomes a topic of their conversation. In the same way, in a family that loves God, people should be sharing their insights and testimonies about their walk with God. They might be sending each other messages about a daily reading in the Bible. They might make plans together to invite another family to church. They might share praise songs they love and play it on the radio or sing it together at home. They talk about church to share about who they are loving or what they're learning or how they're serving. Talking about it again and again reveals and also sustains our excitement for God. Growing up, we used to wear these WWJD bracelets. Looking at it was supposed to remind us to be devoted to God. And that's the logic behind verses 8 and 9. Tie them to your hands. Wear them on your foreheads as reminders. Write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. You might think that this is kind of extreme and that no one would actually do this. But I used to be in a church that rented office space from a Jewish owner. And he had a little scroll holder on the doorway and it was, there was a little tiny scroll inside. And the little decorative scroll holder proclaims, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is God alone and you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, and strength. And Jews who are practicing will sometimes touch the scroll on their way in and kiss their fingers as a reminder that they are to love the Lord their God. Many Jews have these little scroll holders on their doors and it shows that it's possible to integrate devotion into traditions and habits that are beautiful and joyful. And we are supposed to come up with family practices that allow us to celebrate and share our faith. Perhaps a practice of praying together before dinner, listening to praise music in the car on the way to some particular place, getting an app that will remind us to read the Bible, maybe sponsoring a child through compassion, or making it a rhythm of going on a mission trip as a family instead of a vacation every other year. These holy habits are not meant to make you weird, but it's meant to help you celebrate the God who anchors our identity and secures our future. You can't make a horse drink, but you're supposed to lead the horse to water. And we can't make our kids love God, but we can instill holy habits and discuss our faith as a family. We can and we must because it's our job to pass on the faith to the next generation. It's not enough to drop off kids at the church program. We must live out our faith together. If we expect the church to be taking care of discipling our kids, then year by year and generation by generation, the church's influence will weaken. Like I said, when parents really could not have deep conversations with their kids because they literally did not speak the same language, and when parents are working desperately to keep food on the table, God was willing to do more through the church. But we have been blessed. We have cultural competence. If we refuse to do what we can, and if we keep offloading our calling onto church professionals, then God will not be pleased. The paradox is the more that you depend exclusively on the pastor, the less the pastor can do for you. Can a counselor or therapist help you if you're not willing to discuss your trauma? Can a coach or teacher help you if you're not willing to put in the work? One helpful way to understand how churches and families are supposed to work together is called the orange way. Orange is a combination of red, and yellow, and church provides the yellow. Like bright yellow light, we clearly explain who God is. 
the home provides the red, by providing consistent and compassionate love. When parents love their kids and share their love of God with their kids, and when church teaches the core truths of Christianity clearly, then God releases the Holy Spirit to fully energize and motivate the next generation. And it's never too late to begin again. We don't have to be rich or big as a church, and you don't have to be sweet or perfect as a family. We can be dysfunctional and broken as long as we stay humble. We simply say our lives are messed up. We don't know what to do, but God, our eyes are on you. And that is when God promises revival. I say this with confidence because Jesus has already carried the cross for us. While we were sinners, Christ died for us. God has shown he's already committed, and God is always ready to save. All we have to do is, yes, I trust you, and I will do the next thing you ask me to do. Even if your parents didn't model faith for you, even if you never talked to them, you can do it for your kids. Remember that Moses is addressing a generation whose parents were passive and unwilling to obey God. God invited this generation, the child of those parents, to expect more grace and to be more of a discipler than their parents were. What your parents thought was impossible will be possible for you. You must simply ask God for the next command to obey. Then as we disciple our kids, the Bible will come alive in our church and our hearts will be restored in our homes and our parents and kids will join us as we testify that surely God is in our midst. Would you pray with me? God, would you help us to confess our sins and to realize that patting ourselves on the back for coming to church as if that absolved us of all responsibility, that that is a sinful attitude. Would you help us to recognize that, yes, it's better to take our kids to church than not, but dropping them off and thinking that that fulfills our requirements as Christian adults, that that does not please you. God, would you help us to recognize that we are not discipling our children in the way that you command, and as a result, we are lacking a motivation for our own growth, and we're missing out on the blessings that you are wanting to pour out into our community. God, would you help us most of all to see that we are not expressing the love that you have given to our hearts. You have loved us well, and there was a time when we heard the gospel that we wanted to love you back, but we didn't express our love through obedience and through helping others obey. And because that love went unexpressed, that love began to lose fervor, and we sometimes have trouble even feeling anything. God, this is our condition. Despite our numbers and despite our budget, in many ways our church is weak. And despite all that we try to provide for our families, in many ways our home life is a mess. But God, would you help us to confess to you our need, to put our gaze upon you and say, God, I don't know what to do, but my gaze is on you and I will obey the next thing you command. Let it be for our good and for your glory. These things we pray in Christ's name.